Chapter Twenty One of the Adventures of Odysseus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clatt. The Adventures of Odysseus and the Tale of Troy, by Park Colum. Part Two, Chapter Six. When the sun sank and darkness came on, my men went to lie by the hawsers of the ship. Then Circe the Enchantress took my hand and making me sit down by her, told me of the voyage that was before us. "'To the sirens first you shall come,' said she, "'to the sirens, who sit in their field of flowers and bewitch all men who come near them. He who comes near the sirens without knowing their ways and hears the sounds of their voices, never again shall that man see wife or child or have joy of his homecoming.' All round where the sirens sit are great heaps of the bones of men. But I will tell thee, Odysseus, how thou mayest pass them. When thou comest near, put wax over the ears of thy company, lest any of them hear the sirens' song. But if thou thyself art minded to hear, let thy company bind thee hand and foot to the mast. And if thou shalt beseech them to loose thee, they must bind thee with tighter bonds." When thy companions have driven the ship past where the sirens sing, thou canst be unbound. Past where the sirens sit there is a dangerous place indeed. On one side there are great rocks which the gods call the rocks wandering. No ship ever escapes that goes that way. And round these rocks the planks of ships and the bodies of men are tossed by the waves of the sea and storms of fire. One ship only ever passed that way. Jason's ship, the Argo, and that ship would have been broken on the rocks if Hera the goddess had not helped it to pass, because of her love for the hero Jason. On the other side of the rocks wandering are two peaks through which thou wilt have to take thy ship. One peak is smooth and sheer and goes up to the clouds of heaven. In the middle of it there is a cave, and that cave is the den of a monster named Scylla. This monster has six necks, and on each neck there is a hideous head. She holds her heads over the gulf, seeking for prey and yelping horribly. No ship has ever passed that way without Scylla seizing and carrying off in each mouth of her six heads the body of a man. The other peak is near. Thou couldst send an arrow across to it from Scylla's den. Out of the peak a fig-tree grows, and below that fig-tree Charybdis has her den. She sits there sucking down the water and spouting it forth. Mayst thou not be near when she sucks the water down, for then nothing could save thee. Keep nearer to Scylla's than to Charybdis's rock. It is better to lose six of your company than to lose thy ship and all thy company. Keep near Scylla's rock and drive right on. If thou shouldst win past the deadly rocks guarded by Scylla and Charybdis, thou wilt come to the island of Thrinacia. There the cattle of the sun graze with immortal nymphs to guard them. If thou comest to that island, do no hurt to those herds. If thou dost hurt to them, I foresee ruin for thy ship and thy men, even though thou thyself shouldst escape. So Circe spoke to me, and having told me such things, she took her way up the island. Then I went to the ship and roused my men. Speedily they went aboard, and having taken their seats upon the benches, struck the water with their oars. Then the sails were hoisted, and a breeze came, and we sailed away from the isle of Circe, the enchantress. I told my companions what Circe had told me about the sirens in their field of flowers. I took a great piece of wax, and broke it, and kneaded it until it was soft. Then I covered the ears of my men, and they bowed me upright to the mast of the ship. The wind dropped and the sea became calm, as though a god had stilled the waters. My company took their oars and pulled away. When the ship was within a man's shout from the land we had come near, the sirens espied us and raised their song. "'Come hither, come hither, O Odysseus,' the sirens sang. "'Stay thy bark and listen to our song. None hath ever gone this way in his ship.' until he hath heard from our own lips the voice, sweet as honeycomb, and hath joy of it, and gone on his way a wiser man. We know all things, all the travail the Greeks had in the wars of Troy, 
and we know all that hereafter shall be upon the earth. Odysseus, Odysseus, come to our field of flowers, and hear the song that we shall sing to thee. My heart was mad to listen to the sirens. I nodded my head to the company, commanding them to unloose me, but they bound me tighter, and bent to their oars and rowed on. When we had gone past the place of the sirens, the men took the wax from off their ears and loosed me from the mast. But no sooner had we passed the island than I saw smoke arising and heard the roaring of the sea. My company threw down their oars in terror. I went amongst them to hearten them, and I made them remember how my device we had escaped from the cave of the Cyclops. I told them nothing of the monster Scylla, lest the fear of her should break their hearts. And now we began to drive through that narrow strait. On one side was Scylla and the other Charybdis. Fear gripped the men when they saw Charybdis gulping down the sea. But as we drove by the monster Scylla seized six of my company, the hardiest of the men who were with me. As they were lifted up in the mouths of her six heads they called to me in their agony, but I could do nothing to aid them. They were carried up to be devoured in the monster's den. Of all the sights I have seen on the ways of the water, that sight was the most pitiful. Having passed the rocks of Scylla and Charybdis we came to the island of Thrinacia. While we were yet on the ship I heard the lowing of the cattle of the sun. I spoke to my company and told them that we should drive past that island and not venture to go upon it. The hearts of my men were broken within them at that sentence, and Eurylochus answered me, speaking sadly, It is easy for thee, O Odysseus, to speak like that, for thou art never weary, and thou hast strength beyond measure. But is thy heart too of iron, that thou wilt not suffer thy companions to set foot upon shore, where they may rest themselves from the sea, and prepare their supper at their ease? So Eurylochus spoke, and the rest of the company joined in what he said. Their force was greater than mine. Then said I, Swear to me a mighty oath, one and all of you, that if we go upon this island none of you will slay the cattle out of any herd. They swore the oath that I gave them. We brought our ship to a harbour, and landed near a spring of fresh water, and the men got their supper ready. Having eaten their supper they fell to weeping, for they thought upon their comrades that Scylla had devoured. Then they slept. The dawn came, but we found that we could not take our ship out of the harbour, for the north wind and the east wind blew a hurricane. So we stayed upon the island, and the days and weeks went by. When the corn we had brought in the ship was all eaten, the men went through the island fishing and hunting. Little they got to stay their hunger. One day, while I slept, Eurylochus gave the men a most evil counsel. Every death, he said, is hateful to man, but death by hunger is far the worst. Rather than die of hunger, let us drive off the best cattle from the herds of the sun. Then, if the gods would wreck us on the sea for deceit, let them do it. I would rather perish on the waves than die in the pangs of hunger." So he spoke, and the rest of the men approved of what he said. They slaughtered them and roasted their flesh. It was then that I awakened from my sleep. As I came down to the ship the smell of the roasting flesh came to me. Then I knew that a terrible deed had been committed, and that a dreadful thing would befall all of us. For six days my company feasted on the best of the cattle. On the seventh day the wind ceased to blow. Then we went to the ship and set up the mast and the sails and fared out again on the deep. But having left that island, no other land appeared, only sky and sea were to be seen. A cloud stayed always above our ship, and beneath that cloud the sea was darkened. The west wind came in a rush, and the mast broke, and in breaking struck off the head of the pilot, and he fell straight down into the sea. A thunderbolt struck the ship, and the men were swept from the deck. Never a man of my company did I see again. The west wind ceased to blow, but the south wind came, and it drove the ship back on its course. It rushed towards the terrible rocks of Scylla and Charybdis. All night long was I borne on, and at the rising of the sun I found myself near Charybdis. My ship was sucked down but I caught the branches of the fig-tree that grew out of the rock and hung to it like a bat. There I stayed until the timbers of my ship were cast up again by Charybdis. 
I dropped down on them. Sitting on the boards I rode with my hands and passed the rock of Scylla without the monster seeing me. Then for nine days I was borne along by the waves, and on the tenth day I came to Ogygia, where the nymph Calypso dwells. She took me to her dwelling and treated me kindly. But why tell the remainder of my toils? To thee, O king, and to thy noble wife I told how I came from Calypso's island, and I am not one to repeat a plain told tale. End of section 21two of the adventures of odysseus this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by elizabeth clett the adventures of odysseus and the tale of troy by park colum part two chapter seven odysseus finished and the company in the hall sat silent like men enchanted then king alcinous spoke and said never as far as we phaeacians are concerned Wilt thou, Odysseus, be driven from thy homeward way? To-morrow we will give thee a ship and an escort, and we will land thee in Ithaca, thine own country. The princes, captains, and counsellors, marvelling that they had met the renowned Odysseus, went each to his own home. When the dawn had come, each carried down to the ship on which Odysseus was to sail, gifts for him. When the sun was near its setting, they all came back to the king's hall to take farewell of him. The king poured out a great bowl of wine as an offering to the gods. Then Odysseus rose up and placed in the queen's hands a two-handled cup, and he said, Farewell to thee, O queen. Mayest thou long rejoice in thy house and thy children, and in thy husband Alcinous, the renowned king. He passed over the threshold of the king's house, and he went down to the ship. He went aboard and lay down on the deck on a sheet and rug that had been spread for him. Straight away the mariners took to their oars and hoisted their sails, and the ship sped on like a strong sea-bird. Odysseus slept, and lightly the ship sped on, bearing that man who had suffered so much sorrow of heart in passing through wars of men and through troublous seas. The ship sped on, and he slept, and was forgetful of all that he had passed through. When the dawn came the ship was near to the island of Ithaca. The mariners drove to a harbour near which there was a great cave. They ran the ship ashore and lifted out Odysseus, wrapped in the sheet and the rugs, and still sleeping. They left him on the sandy shore of his own land. Then they took the gifts which the king and queen, the princes, captains, and counsellors of the Phaeacians had given him, and they set them by an olive-tree, a little apart from the road, so that no wandering person might come upon them before Odysseus had awakened. Then they went back to their ship and departed from Ithaca, for their own land. Odysseus awakened on the beach of his own land. A mist lay over all, and he did not know what land he had come to. He thought that the Phaeacians had left him forsaken on a strange shore. As he looked around him in his bewilderment, he saw one who was like a king's son approaching. Now the one who came near him was not a young man, but a goddess, Pallas Athena, who had made herself look like a young man. Odysseus arose and questioned her as to the land he had come to. The goddess answered him and said, This is Ithaca, a land good for goats and cattle, a land of woods and wells. Even as she spoke she changed from the semblance of a young man, and was seen by Odysseus as a woman tall and fair. Dost thou not know me, Pallas Athena, the daughter of Zeus, who has always helped thee? The goddess said. I would have been more often by thy side, only I did not want to go openly against my brother Poseidon, the god of the sea, whose son Polyphemus thou didst blind. As the goddess spoke, the mist that lay on the land scattered, and Odysseus saw that he was indeed in Ithaca, his own country. He knew the harbour and the cave and hill Nereton all covered with its forest. And knowing them he knelt on the ground, and kissed the earth of his country. Then the goddess helped him to lay his goods within the cave, the gold and the bronze and the woven raiment that the Phaeacians had given him. She made him sit beside her under the olive-tree, while she told him of the things that were happening in his house. "'There is trouble in thy halls, Odysseus,' she said. 
and it would be well for thee not to make thyself known for a time. Harden thy heart, that thou mayest endure for a while longer ill-treatment at the hands of men." She told him about the wooers of his wife, who filled his halls all day and wasted his substance, and who would slay him, lest he should punish them for their insolence. So that the doom of Agamemnon shall not befall thee, thy slaying within thine own halls, I will change thine appearance that no man shall know thee, the goddess said. Then she made a change in his appearance that would have been evil, but that it was to last for a while only. She made his skin wither, and she dimmed his shining eyes. She made his yellow hair grey and scanty. Then she changed his raiment to a beggar's wrap, torn and stained with smoke. Over his shoulder she cast the hide of a deer, and she put into his hands a beggar's staff, with a tattered bag and a cord to hang it by. And when she had made this change in his appearance, the goddess left Odysseus and went from Ithaca. It was then that she came to Telemachus in Sparta, and counselled him to leave the house of Menelaus and Helen, and it has been told how he went with Piusistratus, the son of Nestor, and came to his own ship. His ship was hailed by a man who was flying from those who would slay him, and this man Telemachus took aboard. The stranger's name was Theoclymenus, and he was a soothsayer and a second-sighted man. And Telemachus, returning to Ithaca, was in peril of his life. The wooers of his mother had discovered that he had gone from Ithaca in a ship. Two of the wooers, Antinous and Eurymachus, were greatly angered at the daring act of the youth. "'He has gone to Sparta for help,' Antinous said, "'and if he finds that there are those who will help him, we will not be able to stand against his pride. He will make us suffer for what we have wasted in his house. But let us too act. I will take a ship with twenty men, and lie in wait for him in a strait between Ithaca and Samos, and put an end to his search for his father." Thereupon Antinous took twenty men to a ship, and fixing mast and sails they went over the sea. There is a little isle between Ithaca and Samos, Asteris it is called, and in the harbour of that isle he and his men lay in wait for Telemachus. End of section 22《The Adventures of Odysseus》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. — The Adventures of Odysseus and the Tale of Troy by Parik Colum. Part 2 Chapter 8 Near the place where Odysseus had landed, there lived an old man who was a faithful servant in his house. Eumaeus was his name, and he was a swineherd. He had made for himself a dwelling in the wildest part of the island, and had built a wall round it, and had made for the swine pens in the courtyard twelve pens, and in each pen there were fifty swine. Old Eumaeus lived in this place tending the swine with three young men to help him. The swine pens were guarded by four dogs that were as fierce as the beasts of the forest. As he came near the dogs dashed at him, yelping and snapping, and Odysseus might have suffered foul hurt if the swineherd had not run out of the courtyard and driven the fierce dogs away. Seeing before him one who looked an ancient beggar, Eumaeus said, "'Old man, it is well that my dogs did not tear thee, for they might have brought upon me the shame of thy death. I have grief and pains enough, the gods know, without such a happening. Here I sit, mourning for my noble master, and fattening hogs for others to eat, while he mayhap is wandering in hunger through some friendless city. But come in, old man, I have bread and wine to give thee." The swineherd led the seeming beggar into the courtyard, and he let him sit down on a heap of brushwood, and spread for him a shaggy goat-skin. Odysseus was glad of his servant's welcome, and he said, May Zeus and all the other gods grant thee thy heart's dearest wish for the welcome that thou hast given to me. Said Eumaeus the swineherd, A good man looks on all strangers and beggars as being from Zeus himself, and my heart's dearest wish is that my master Odysseus should return. Ah, if Odysseus were here, he would give me something which I could hold as mine own, a piece of ground to till, and a wife to comfort me. But my master will not return, and we thralls must go in fear when young lords come to rule it over them." He went to the swine-pens and brought out two sucking pigs. 
he slaughtered them and cut them small and roasted the meat. When all was cooked he brought portions to Odysseus sprinkled with barley meal, and he brought him too wine in a deep bowl of ivy wood. And when Odysseus had eaten and drunk, Eumaeus the swineherd said to him, Old man, no wanderer ever comes to this land but that our lady Penelope sends for him and gives him entertainment, hoping that he will have something to tell her of her lord Odysseus. They all do as thou wouldst do if thou earnest to her, tell her a tale of having seen or having heard of her lord, to win her ear. But as for Odysseus, no matter what wanderers or vagrants say, he will never return. Dogs or wild birds or the fishes of the deep have devoured his body ere this. Never again shall I find so good a lord, nor would I find one so kind even if I were back in my own land, and saw the faces of my father and mother. But not so much for them do I mourn, as for the loss of my master. Said Odysseus, Thou sayest that thy master will never return, but I notice that thou art slow to believe thine own words. Now I tell thee that Odysseus will return, and in this same year. And as sure as the old moon wanes and the young moon is born, he will take vengeance on those whom you have spoken of, those who eat his substance and dishonour his wife and son. I say that, and I swear it with an oath. I do not heed thine oath, said Eumaeus the swineherd. I do not listen to vagrants' tales about my master, since a stranger came here and cheated us with a story. He told us that he had seen Odysseus in the land of the Cretans, in the house of the hero Idomeneus, mending his ships that had been broken by the storm, and that he would be here by summer or by harvest time, bringing with him much wealth. As they were speaking the younger swineherds came back from the woods, bringing the drove of swine into the courtyard. There was a mighty din whilst the swine were being put into their pens. Supper time came on, and Eumaeus and Odysseus and the younger swineherds sat down to a meal. Eumaeus carved the swine-flesh, giving the best portion to Odysseus, whom he treated as the guest of honour. And Odysseus said, Eumaeus, surely thou art counselled by Zeus, seeing thou dost give the best of the meat even to such a one as I. And Eumaeus, thinking Odysseus was praising him for treating a stranger kindly, said, Eat, stranger, and make merry with such fare as is here. The night came on cold with rain. Then Odysseus, to test the kindliness of the swineherd, said, Oh, that I were young and could endure this bitter night! Oh, that I were better off! Then would one of you swineherds give me a wrap to cover myself from the wind and rain! But now, verily, I am an outcast because of my sorry raiment. Then Eumaeus sprang up and made a bed for Odysseus near the fire. Odysseus lay down, and the swineherd covered him with a mantle he kept for a covering when great storms should arise. Then, that he might better guard the swine, Eumaeus, wrapping himself up in a cloak, and taking with him a sword and javelin, to drive off wild beasts should they come near, went to lie nearer to the pens. When morning came Odysseus said, I am going to the town to beg, so that I need take nothing more from thee. Send someone with me to be a guide. I would go to the house of Odysseus, and see if I can earn a little from the wooers who were there. Right well could I serve them if they would take me on. There could be no better serving man than I when it comes to splitting faggots and kindling a fire and carving meat. Nay, nay, said Eumaeus, do not go there, stranger. None here at a loss by thy presence. Stay until the son of Odysseus, Telemachus, returns, and he will do something for thee. Go not near the wooers. It is not such a one as thee that they would have to serve them. Stay this day with us. Odysseus did not go to the town, but stayed all day with Eumaeus. And at night, when he and Eumaeus and the younger swineherds were seated at the fire, Odysseus said, Thou too, Eumaeus, hast wandered far, and hast had many sorrows. Tell us how thou camest to be a slave and a swineherd. THE STORY OF Eumaeus THE SWINEHERD There is, said Eumaeus, a certain island over against Ortygia. That island has two cities, and my father was king over them both. There came to the city where my father dwelt, a ship with merchants from the land of the Phoenicians. I was a child then, and there was in my father's house a Phoenician slave-woman who nursed me. Once, when she was washing clothes, one of the sailors from the Phoenician ship spoke to her, and asked her would she like to go back with them to their own land. 
She spoke to that sailor and told him her story. I am from Sidon in the Phoenician land, she said, and my father was named Artabus, and was famous for his riches. Sea robbers caught me one day as I was crossing the fields, and they stole me away and brought me here, and sold me to the master of yonder house. Then said the sailor to her, Your father and mother are still alive, I know, and they have lost none of their wealth. Wilt thou not come with us and see them again? Then the woman made the sailors swear that they would bring her safely to the city of Sidon. She told them that when their ship was ready she would come down to it, and that she would bring what gold she could lay her hands on away from her master's house, and that she would also bring the child whom he nursed. He is a wise child, she said, and you can sell him for a slave when you get to a foreign land. When the Phoenician ship was ready to depart, they sent a message to the woman. The sailor who had brought the message brought to a chain of gold with amber beads strung here and there for my mother to buy. And while my mother and her handmaids were handling the chain, the sailor nodded to the woman, and she went out, taking with her three cups of gold, and leading me by the hand. The sun sank, and all the ways were darkened. But the Phoenician woman went down to the harbour and came to the ship and went aboard it. And when the sailor who had gone to my father's house came back, they raised the mast and sails, and took the oars in their hands, and drew the ship away from our land. We sailed away, and I was left stricken at heart. For six days we sailed over the sea, and on the seventh day the woman died and her body was cast into the deep. The wind and the waves bore us to Ithaca, and there the merchants sold me to Laertes, the father of Odysseus. The wife of Laertes reared me kindly, and I grew up with the youngest of her daughters, the lovely Statemi. But Statemi went to Same, and was married to one of the princes of that land. Afterwards Laertes' lady sent me to work in the fields. But always she treated me kindly. Now Laertes' lady is dead, she wasted away from grief when she heard no tidings of her only son Odysseus. Laertes yet lives, but since the death of his noble wife he never leaves his house. All day he sits by his fire, they say, and thinks upon his son's doom, and how his son's substance is being wasted, and how his son's son will have little to inherit. So Odysseus passed part of the night, Eumaeus telling him of his wanderings and his sorrows. And while they were speaking, Telemachus, the son of Odysseus, came to Ithaca in his good ship. Antinous had lain in wait for him, and had posted sentinels to watch for his ship. Nevertheless Telemachus had passed by without being seen by his enemies. And having come to Ithaca, he bade one of his comrades bring the ship into the wharf of the city, while he himself went to another place. Leaving the ship he came to the dwelling of the servant he most trusted, to the dwelling of Eumaeus, the swineherd. End of section 23 Of the Adventures of Odysseus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. The Adventures of Odysseus and the Tale of Troy by Park Colum. Part two, Chapter nine. On the morning of his fourth day in Ithaca, as he and the swineherd were eating a meal together, Odysseus heard the sound of footsteps approaching the hut. The fierce dogs were outside and he expected to hear them yelping against the stranger's approach. No sound came from them. Then he saw a young man come to the entrance of the courtyard, the swineherd's dogs fawning upon him. When Eumaeus saw this young man he let fall the vessels he was carrying, and running to him, kissed his head and his eyes and his hands. While he was kissing and weeping over him, Odysseus heard the swineherd saying, "'Telemachus, art thou come back to us?' Like a light in the darkness thou hast appeared. I thought that never again should I see thee when I heard thou hadst taken a ship to Pylos. Come in, dear son, come in, that I may see thee once again in mine own house." Odysseus raised his head and looked at his son. As a lion might look over his cub, so he looked over Telemachus. But neither the swineherd nor Telemachus was aware of Odysseus's gaze. "'I have come to see thee, friend Eumaeus said Telemachus, for before I go into the city I would know whether my mother is still in the house of Odysseus, or whether one of the wooers has at last taken her as a wife to his own house. 
Thy mother is still in thy father's house, Eumaeus answered. Then Telemachus came within the courtyard. Odysseus, in the guise of the old beggar, rose from his seat, but the young man said to him courteously, Be seated, friend, another seat can be found for me. Eumaeus strewed green brushwood and spread a fleece upon it, and Telemachus seated himself. Next Eumaeus fetched a meal for him, oaten cakes and swine flesh and wine. While they were eating the swineherd said, We have here a stranger who has wandered through many countries, and who has come to my house as a suppliant. Wilt thou take him for thy man, Telemachus? Said Telemachus, How can I support any man? I have not the strength of hand to defend mine own house. But for this stranger I will do what I can. I will give him a mantle and doublet, with shoes for his feet and a sword to defend himself, and I will send him on whatever way he wants to go. But, Eumaeus, I would not have him go near my father's house. The wooers grow more insolent each day, and they might mock the stranger if he went amongst them. Then said Odysseus, speaking for the first time, Young sir, what thou hast said seems strange to me. Dost thou willingly submit to insolence in thine own father's house? But perhaps it is that the people of the city hate thee, and will not help thee against thine enemies. Ah, if I had such youth as I have spirit, or if I were the son of Odysseus, I should go amongst them this very day and make myself the bane of each of them. I would rather die in mine own halls than see such shame as is reported, strangers mocked at, and servants injured, and wine and food wasted. Said Telemachus, The people of the city do not hate me, and they would help me if they could. But the wooers of my mother are powerful men, men to make the city folk afraid. And if I should oppose them I would assuredly be slain in my father's house, for how can I hope to overcome so many? What wouldst thou have me do for thee, Telemachus? said the swineherd. I would have thee go to my mother, friend Eumaeus, Telemachus said, and let her know that I am safe returned from Pylos. Eumaeus at once put sandals upon his feet and took his staff in his hands. He begged Telemachus to rest himself in the hut, and then he left the courtyard and went towards the city. Telemachus lay down on his seat and closed his eyes in weariness. He saw, while thinking that he only dreamt it, a woman come to the gate of the courtyard. She was fair and tall and splendid, and the dog shrank away from her presence with a whine. She touched the beggar with a golden wand. As she did, the marks of age and beggary fell from him, and the man stood up as tall and noble-looking. "'Who art thou?' cried Telemachus, starting up. "'Even a moment ago thou didst look aged and a beggar. Now thou dost look a chief of men. Art thou one of the divine ones?' Odysseus looked upon him and said, My son, do not speak so to me. I am Odysseus, thy father. After much suffering and much wandering I have come to my own country. He kissed his son with tears flowing down his cheeks, and Telemachus threw his arms around his father's neck, but scarce believing that the father he had searched for was indeed before him. But no doubt was left as Odysseus talked to him, and told him how he had come to Ithaca in a ship given him by the Phaeacians, and how he had brought with him gifts of bronze and raiment that were hidden in the cave, and told him, too, how Pallas Athena had changed his appearance into that of an old beggar. And when his own story was finished, he said, "'Come, my son, tell me of the wooers who waste the substance of our house. Tell me how many they number, and who they are, so that we may prepare a way of dealing with them.' Even though thou art a great warrior, my father, thou and I cannot hope to deal with them. They have come not from Ithaca alone, but from all the islands around, from Dulichium, and Same, and Zacynthus. We too cannot deal with such a throng. Said Odysseus, I shall make a plan to deal with them. Go thou home, and keep company with the wooers. Later in the day this wine-herd will lead me into the city, and I shall go into the house in the likeness of an old beggar, and if thou shouldst see any of the wooers ill-treat me, harden thine heart to endure it. Even if they drag me by the feet to the door of the house, keep quiet thou. And let no one, not even thy mother Penelope, nor my father Laertes, know that Odysseus has returned. Telemachus said, My father, thou shalt soon learn what spirit is in me and what wisdom I have. While they talked together, the ship that Antinous had taken, 
when he went to lie in wait for Telemachus, returned. The wooers assembled and debated whether they should kill Telemachus, for now there was danger that he would draw the people to his side, and so make up a force that could drive the wooers out of Ithaca. But they did not agree to kill him, for there was one amongst them who was against the deed. Eumaeus brought the news to Telemachus and Odysseus of the return of Antinous's ship. He came back to the hut in the afternoon. Pallas Athena had again given Odysseus the appearance of an ancient beggar-man, and the swineherd saw no change in his guest. End of section 24《Of the Adventures of Odysseus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. The Adventures of Odysseus and the Tale of Troy by Parik Colum. Part 2, Chapter 10. It was time for Telemachus to go into the city. He put his sandals on his feet and took his spear in his hand, and then speaking to the swineherd he said, Friend Eumaeus, I am now going into the city to show myself to my mother and to let her hear from my own lips the tale of my journey. And I have an order to leave with thee. Take this stranger into the city, that he may go about as he desires, asking alms from the people. Odysseus, in the guise of a beggar, said, I thank thee, Lord Telemachus. I would not stay here, for I am not of an age to wait about a hut and courtyard, obeying the orders of a master, even if that master be as good a man as thy swineherd. Go thy way, Lord Telemachus, and Eumaeus, as thou hast bidden him, will lead me into the city. Telemachus then passed out of the courtyard, and went the ways until he came into the city. When he went into the house, the first person he saw was his nurse, old Eurycleia, who welcomed him with joy. To Eurycleia he spoke of the guest who had come on his ship, Theoclymenus. He told her that this guest would be in the house that day, and that he was to be treated with all honour and reverence. The wooers came into the hall and crowded around him, with fair words in their mouths. Then they all sat down at tables, and Eurycleia brought wheaten bread and wine and dainties. Just at that time Odysseus and Eumaeus were journeying towards the city. Odysseus, in the guise of a beggar, had a ragged bag across his shoulders, and he carried a staff that the swineherd had given him, to help him over the slippery ground. They went by a rugged path, and they came to a place where a spring flowed into a basin made for its water, and where there was an altar to the nymphs, at which men made offerings. As Eumaeus and Odysseus were resting at the spring, a servant from Odysseus's house came along. He was a goatherd, and Melanthius was his name. He was leading a flock of goats for the wooers to kill, and when he saw the swineherd with the seeming beggar he cried out, now we see the vile leading the vile. Say, swineherd, whither art thou leading this wretch? It is easy to see the sort of fellow he is. He is the sort to rub shoulders against many door-posts, begging for scraps. Nothing else is he good for. But if thou wouldst give him to me, swineherd, I would make him watch my fields, and sweep out my stalls, and carry fresh water to the kids. He'd have his dish of whey from me. But a fellow like this doesn't want an honest job. He wants to lounge through the country, filling his belly without doing anything for the people who feed him up. If he goes to the house of Odysseus, I pray that he be pelted from the door." He said all this as he came up to them with his flock of goats, and as he went by he gave a kick to Odysseus. Odysseus took thought whether he should strike the fellow with his staff or fling him upon the ground. But in the end he hardened his heart to endure the insult and let the goatherd go on his way. But turning to the altar that was by the spring, he prayed, Nymphs of the well, if ever Odysseus made offerings to you, fulfill for me this wish, that he, even Odysseus, may come to his own home and have power to chastise the insolence that gathers round his house. They journeyed on, and when they came near they heard the sound of the lyre within the house. The wooers were now feasting and Phemius the minstrel was singing to them. And when Odysseus came before his own house, he caught the swineherd by the hand suddenly, and with a hard grip, and he said, Lo now, I who have wandered in many lands, and have walked in pain through many cities, have at last come to the house of Odysseus. There it is, standing as of old, with building beyond building, with its walls and its battlements, its courts and its doors 
the house of Odysseus verily. And lo! unwelcome men keep revel within it, and the smoke of their feast rises up, and the sound of the lyre is heard playing for them. Said Eumaeus, What wilt thou have me do for thee, friend? Shall I bring thee into the hall and before the company of wooers, whilst I remain here? Or wouldst thou have me go in before thee? I would have thee go in before me, Odysseus said. Now as they went through the courtyard, a thing happened that dashed Odysseus's eyes with tears. A hound lay in the dirt of the yard, a hound that was very old. All uncared for he lay in the dirt, old and feeble. But he had been a famous hound, and Odysseus himself had trained him before he went to the wars of Troy. Argos was his name. Now as Odysseus came near, the hound Argos knew him, and stood up before him and whined and dropped his ears, but had no strength to come near him. Odysseus knew the hound and stopped and gazed at him. "'A good hound lies there,' said he to Eumaeus. "'Once, I think, he was so swift that no beast in the deep places of the wood could flee from him.' Then he went on, and the hound Argos lay down in the dirt of the yard, and that same day the life passed from him. Behind Eumaeus the swineherd he came into his own hall in the appearance of a beggar, wretchedly clad and leaning on an old man's staff. Odysseus looked upon the young lords who wooed his wife, and then he sat down upon the threshold and went no further into the hall. Telemachus was there. Seeing Eumaeus he called to him and gave the swineherd bread and meat, and said, Take these and give them to the stranger at the doorway, and tell him that he may go amongst the company and crave an alms from each. Odysseus ate while the minstrel was finishing his song. When it was finished he rose up and went into the hall, craving an alms from each of the wooers. Seeing him, Antinous, the most insolent of the wooers, cried out, "'O oh, notorious swineherd! Why didst thou bring this fellow here? Have we not enough vagabonds? Is it nothing to thee that the worthless fellows come here and devour thy master's substance?' Hearing such a speech from Antinous, Telemachus had to say, Antinous, I see that thou hast good care for me and mine. I marvel that thou hast such good care. But wouldst thou have me drive a stranger from the door? The gods forbid that I should do such a thing. Nay, Antinous, give the stranger something for the sake of the house. If all the company gives him as much as I, he will have something to keep him from beggary for a three months' space, said Antinous, meaning by that that he would work some hurt upon the beggar. Odysseus came before him. They say that thou art the noblest of all the wooers, he said, and for that reason thou shouldst give me a better thing than any of the others have given me. Look upon me. I too had a house of mine own, and was accounted wealthy amongst men, and I had servants to wait upon me. And many a time would I make welcome the wanderer and give him something from my store. Stand far away from my table, thou wretched fellow, said Antinous. Then said Odysseus, Thou hast beauty, Lord Antinous, but thou hast not wisdom. Out of thine own house thou wouldst not give a grain of salt to a suppliant, and even whilst thou dost sit at another man's table, thou dost not find it in thy heart to give something out of the plenty that is before thee. So Odysseus spoke, and Antinous became terribly angered. He caught up a footstool, and with it he struck Odysseus in the back, at the base of the right shoulder. Such a blow would have knocked another man over, but Odysseus stood steadfast under it. He gave one look at Antinous, and then without a word he went over and sat down again upon the threshold. Telemachus had in his heart a mighty rage for the stroke that had been given his father, but he let no tear fall from his eyes, and he sat very still, brooding in his heart evil for the wooers. Odysseus, after a while, lifted his head and spoke. "'Wooers of the renowned queen,' he said, "'hear what the spirit within me bids me say to you. There is neither pain nor shame in the blow that a man may get in battle. But in the blow that Antinous has given me, a blow aimed at a beggar, there is pain and there is shame. And now I call upon that god who is the avenger of the insult to the poor to bring not a wedding to Antinous, but the issue of death. "'Sit there and eat thy meat in quiet,' Antinous called out. 
or else thou wilt be dragged through the house by thy heels, and the flesh will be stripped off thy bones. And now the Lady Penelope had come into the hall. Hearing that a stranger was there, she sent for Eumaeus, and bade the swineherd bring him to her, that she might question him as to what he had heard about Odysseus. Eumaeus came and told him of Penelope's request. But Odysseus said, Eumaeus, right willing am I to tell the truth about Odysseus to the fair and wise Penelope. But now I may not speak to her. Go to her and tell her that when the wooers have gone I will speak to her, and ask her to give me a seat near the fire, that I may sit and warm myself as I speak, for the clothes I wear are comfortless. As Eumaeus gave the message to the lady Penelope, one who was there, Theoclymenus, the guest who had come in Telemachus's ship, said, O wife of the renowned Odysseus, be sure that thy lord will return to his house. As I came here on the ship of Telemachus, thy son, I saw a happening that is an omen of the return of Odysseus. A bird flew out on the right, a hawk. In his talons he held a dove, and plucked her and shed the feathers down on the ship. By that omen I know that the lord of this high house will return, and strike here in his anger." Penelope left the hall and went back to her own chamber. Next Eumaeus went away to look after his swine. But still the wooers continued to feast, and still Odysseus sat in the guise of a beggar on the threshold of his own house. End of section 25《Of the Adventures of Odysseus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. The Adventures of Odysseus and the Tale of Troy by Parik Colum. Part two, chapter eleven. There was in Ithaca a common beggar. He was a most greedy fellow, and he was nicknamed Iris, because he used to run errands for the servants of Odysseus's house. He came in the evening, and seeing a seeming beggar seated on the threshold, he flew into a rage and shouted at him, "'Get away from here, old fellow, lest you be dragged away by the hand or foot. Look you, the lords within the house are giving me the wink to turn you out. But I can't demean myself by touching the like of you. Get up now and go while I'm easy with you.' Odysseus looked at the fellow and said, "'I have not harmed you in deed or word, and I do not grudge you anything of what you may get in this house. The threshold I sit on is wide enough for the two of us." "'What words this fellow has!' said Iris the beggar. "'He talks like an old sit by the fire. I'll not waste any more words on him. Get up now, heavy paunch, and strip for the fight, for I'm going to show all the lords that I can keep the door for them.' "'Do not provoke me,' said Odysseus. "'Old as I seem, I may be able to draw your blood.' But Iris kept on shouting, I'll knock the teeth out of your jaws. I'll trounce you." Antinous, the most insolent of the wooers, saw the squabble, and he laughed to see the pair defying each other. "'Friends,' said he, "'the gods are good to us, and don't fail to send us amusement. The strange beggar and our own Iris are threatening each other. Let us see that they don't draw back from the fight. Let us match one against the other.' All the wooers trooped to the threshold and stood round the ragged men. Antinous thought of something to make the game more merry. "'There are two great puddings in the larder,' he said. "'Let us offer them for a prize to these pugilists. Come, Iris, come, stranger, a choice of puddings for whichever of you wins the match. Aye, and more than that, whoever wins shall have leave to eat every day in this hall, and no other beggar shall be let come near the house. Go to it now, ye mighty men!' All the wooers crowded round and clapped the men on to the fight. Odysseus said, "'Friends, an old man like me cannot fight one who is younger and abler.' But they cried to him, "'Go on, go on, get into the fight, or else take stripes upon your body.' Then said Odysseus, "'Swear to me, all of you, that none of you will show favour to Iris nor deal me a foul blow.' All the wooers cried out that none would favour Iris or deal his opponent a foul blow. And Telemachus, who was there, said, the man who strikes thee, stranger, will have to take reckoning from me." Straightway Odysseus girt up his rags. When his great arms and shoulders and thighs were seen, the wooers were amazed, and Iris was frightened. He would have slipped away if Antinous had not caught him, and said to him, "'You lubber, you! 
If you do not stand up before this man, I will have you flung on my ship and sent over to King Ectetus, who will cut off your nose and ears and give your flesh to his dogs to eat." He took hold of Iris and dragged him into the ring. The fighters faced each other. But Odysseus, with his hands upraised, stood for long without striking, for he was pondering whether he should strike Iris a hard or a light blow. It seemed to him better to strike lightly, so that his strength should not be made a matter for the wooers to note and wonder at. Iris struck first. He struck Odysseus on the shoulder. Then Odysseus aimed a blow at his neck, just below the ear, and the beggar fell to the ground, with the blood gushing from his mouth and nose. The wooers were not sorry for Iris. They laughed until they were ready to fall backwards. Then Odysseus seized Iris by the feet and dragged him out of the house, and to the gate of the courtyard. He lifted him up and put him standing against the wall. Placing the staff in the beggar's hands, he said, "'Sit there, and scare off the dogs and swine, and do not let such a one as you lord it over strangers. A worse thing might have befallen you.' Then back he went to the hall, with his beggar's bag on his shoulder, and his clothes more ragged than ever. Back he went, and when the wooers saw him they burst into peals of laughter and shouted out, "'May Zeus, O stranger, give thee thy dearest wish and thy heart's desire. Thou only shalt be beggar in Ithaca.' They laughed and laughed again when Antinous brought out the great pudding that was the prize. Odysseus took it from him, and another of the wooers pledged him in a golden cup, saying, "'May you come to your own, O beggar, and may happiness be yours in times to come.' While these things were happening, the wife of Odysseus, the lady Penelope, called to Eurycleia and said, This evening I will go into the hall of our house and speak to my son Telemachus. Bid my two handmaidens make ready to come with me, for I shrink from going among the wooers alone. Eurycleia went to tell the handmaidens, and Penelope washed off her cheeks the traces of the tears that she had wept that day. Then she sat down to wait for the handmaidens to come to her. As she waited she fell into a deep sleep. And as she slept, the goddess Pallas Athena bathed her face in the water of beauty, and took all weariness away from her body, and restored all her youthfulness to her. The sound of the handmaidens' voices as they came in awakened her, and Penelope rose up to go into the hall. Now when she came amongst them with her two handmaidens, one standing on each side of her, the wooers were amazed, for they had never seen one so beautiful. The hearts of all were enchanted with love for her, and each prayed that he might have her for his wife. Penelope did not look on any of the wooers, but she went to her son Telemachus and spoke to him. Telemachus, she said, I have heard that a stranger has been ill-treated in this house. How, my child, dost thou permit such a thing to happen? Telemachus said, My lady mother, thou hast no right to be angered at what took place in this hall. So they spoke to one another, mother and son. Now one of the wooers, Eurymachus by name, spoke to Penelope, saying, Lady, if any more than we beheld thee in the beauty thou hast now, by so many more wouldst thou have wooers to-morrow. Speak not so to me, Lord Eurymachus, said Penelope, speak not of my beauty, which departed in the grief I felt when my lord went to the wars of Troy. Odysseus stood up, and gazed upon his wife who was standing amongst her wooers. Eurymachus noted him, and going to him, said, Stranger, wouldst thou be my hireling? If thou wouldst work on my upland farm, I should give thee food and clothes. But I think thou art practised only in shifts and dodges, and that thou wouldst prefer to go begging thy way through the country. Odysseus, standing there, said to that proud wooer, Lord Eurymachus, if there might be a trial of labour between us two, I know which of us would come out the better man. I would that we two stood together, a scythe in the hands of each, and a good swath of meadow to be mown. Then would I match with thee, fasting from dawn until evening's dark. Or that we were set ploughing together. Then thou shouldst see who would plough the longest and the best furrow. Or would that we two were in the ways of war. Then shouldst thou see who would be in the front rank of battle. Thou dost think thyself a great man. But if Odysseus should return, that door, wide as it is, would be too narrow for thy flight." So angry was Eurymachus at this speech that he would have struck Odysseus if Telemachus had not come amongst the wooers, saying, "'That man must not be struck again in this hall. Sirs, if you have finished feasting, and if the time has come for you, go to your own homes. Go in peace, I pray you.' 
all were astonished that Telemachus should speak so boldly. No one answered him back, for one said to the other, "'What he has said is proper. We have nothing to say against it. To misuse a stranger in the house of Odysseus is a shame. Now let us pour out a libation of wine to the gods, and then let each man go to his home.' The wine was poured out, and the wooers departed. Then Penelope and her handmaidens went to her own chamber, and Telemachus was left with his father Odysseus. End of section 26《of the Adventures of Odysseus》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. The Adventures of Odysseus and the Tale of Troy by Parak Colum. Part two, chapter twelve. To Telemachus, Odysseus said, My son, we must now get the weapons out of the hall, take them down from the walls. Telemachus and his father took down the helmets and shields and sharp-pointed spears. Then said Odysseus, as they carried them out, "'Tomorrow, when the wooers miss the weapons, and say, "'Why have they been taken?' Answer them, saying, "'The smoke of the fire dulled them, and they no longer looked the weapons that my father left behind him when he went to the wars of Troy. Besides, I am fearful lest some day the company in the hall come to a quarrel, one with the other, and snatch the weapons in anger. Strife has come here already, and iron draws iron, men say." Telemachus carried the armor and weapons out of the hall, and hid them in the women's apartment. Then, when the hall was cleared, he went to his own chamber. It was then that Penelope came back to the hall to speak to the stranger. One of her handmaidens, Melantho by name, was there, and she was speaking angrily to him. Now this Melantho was proud and hard of heart, because Antinous often conversed with her. As Penelope came near she was saying, "'Stranger, art thou still here, prying things out and spying on the servants? Be thankful for the supper thou hast gotten, and betake thyself out of this.' Odysseus, looking fiercely at her, said, "'Why shouldst thou speak to me in such a way? If I go in ragged clothes and beg through the land, it is because of my necessity. Once I had a house with servants and with much substance, and the stranger who came there was not abused." The lady Penelope called to the handmaiden, and said, "'Thou, Melantho, didst hear it from mine own lips that I was minded to speak to this stranger, and ask him if he had tidings of my lord. Therefore it does not become thee to revile him.' She spoke to the old nurse who had come with her, and said, "'Euryclea, Bring to the fire a bench with a fleece upon it, that this stranger may sit and tell me his story." Euryclea brought over the bench, and Odysseus sat down near the fire. Then said the lady Penelope, First, stranger, wilt thou tell me who thou art, and what is thy name, and thy race and country? Said Odysseus, Ask me all thou wilt, lady, but inquire not concerning my name, or race, or country lest thou shouldst fill my heart with more pains than I am able to endure. Verily I am a man of grief. But hast thou no tale to tell me? We know of thee, Penelope, for thy fame goes up to heaven, and no one of mortal men can find fault with thee. Then said Penelope, What excellence I had of face or form departed from me when my lord Odysseus went from this hall to the wars of Troy. And since he went a host of ills has beset me, Ah, would that he were here to watch over my life! The lords of all the islands around, Dulichium and Same and Zacynthus, and the lords of the land of Ithaca, have come here and are wooing me against my will. They devour the substance of this house, and my son is being impoverished. Long ago a god put into my mind a device to keep marriage with them away from me. I set up a great web upon my loom, and I spoke to the wooers, saying, Odysseus is assuredly dead, but I crave that you be not eager to speed on this marriage with me. Wait until I finish the web I am weaving. It is a shroud for Odysseus's father, and I make it against the day when death shall come to him. There will be no woman to care for Laertes when I have left his son's house, and I would not have such a hero lie without a shroud, lest the women of our land should blame me for neglect of my husband's father in his last days. So I spoke 
and they agreed to wait until the web was woven. In the daytime I wove it, but at night I unraveled the web. So three years passed away. Then the fourth year came, and my wooers were hard to deal with. My treacherous handmaidens brought them upon me as I was unraveling the web. And now I cannot devise any other plan to keep the marriage away from me. My parents command me to marry one of my wooers. My son cannot long endure to see the substance of his house and field being wasted, and the wealth that should be his destroyed. He too would wish that I would marry. And there is no reason why I should not be wed again, for surely Odysseus my lord is dead. Said Odysseus, Thy lord was known to me. On his way to Troy he came to my land, for the wind blew him out of his course, sending him wandering past Malaya. For twelve days he stayed in my city, and I gave him good entertainment, and saw that he lacked for nothing in cattle or wine or barley meal. When Odysseus was spoken of, the heart of Penelope melted and tears ran down her cheeks. Odysseus had pity for his wife when he saw her weeping for the man who was even then sitting by her. Tears would have run down his own cheeks, only that he was strong enough to hold them back. Said Penelope, Stranger, I cannot help but question thee about Odysseus. What raiment had he on when thou didst see him, and what men were with him? Said Odysseus, Lady, it is hard for one so long parted from him to tell thee what thou hast asked. It is now twenty years since I saw Odysseus. He wore a purple mantle that was fastened with a brooch, and this brooch had on it the image of a hound holding a fawn between its forepaws. All the people marvelled at this brooch, for it was of gold, and the fawn and the hound were done to the life. And I remember that there was a henchman with Odysseus. He was a man somewhat older than his master, round-shouldered and black-skinned and curly-headed. His name was Eurybates, and Odysseus honoured him above the rest of his company. When he spoke, giving such tokens of Odysseus, Penelope wept again, and when she had wept for a long time she said, Stranger, thou wert made welcome, but now thou shalt be honoured in this hall. Thou dost speak of the garments that Odysseus wore. It was I who gave him these garments, folding them myself and bringing them out of the chamber, and it was I who gave him the brooch thou hast described. Ah, it was an evil fate that took him from me, bringing him to Troy, that place too evil to be named by me. Odysseus leaned towards her and said, Do not waste thy heart with endless weeping, lady. Cease from lamentation, and lay up in thy mind the word I give thee. Odysseus is near. He has lost all his companions, and he knows not how to come into this house, whether openly or by stealth. I swear it. By the hearth of Odysseus to which I am come, I swear that Odysseus himself will stand up here before the old moon wanes and the new moon is born. Ah, no, said Penelope. Often before have wanderers told me such comfortable things, and I believed them. I know now that thy word cannot be accomplished. But it is time for thee to rest thyself, stranger. My handmaidens will make a bed for thee in the vestibule, and then come to thee and bathe thy feet. Said Odysseus, Thy handmaidens would be loath to touch the feet of a wanderer such as I. But if there is in the house some old wife who has borne such troubles as I have borne, I would have my feet bathed by her. Said Penelope, Here is an ancient woman who nursed and tended that hapless man Odysseus. She took him in her arms in the very hour he was born. Eurycleia, wash the feet of this man, who knew thy lord and mine. Thereupon the nurse, old Eurycleia, fetched water, both hot and cold, and brought the bath to the hearth. And standing before Odysseus in the flickering light of the fire, she said, I will wash thy feet, both for Penelope's sake and for thine own. The heart within me is moved at the sight of thee. Many strangers have come into this hall, but I have never seen one that was so like as thou art to Odysseus. Said Odysseus, Many people have said that Odysseus and I favour each other. His feet were in the water, and she put her hand upon one of them. As she did so, Odysseus turned his face away to the darkness, for it suddenly came into his mind that his nurse, old Eurycleia, might recognise the scar that was upon that foot. How came it there, that scar? It had been made long ago when a boar's tusk had ripped up the flesh of his foot. Odysseus was then a youth, 
and he had gone to the mountain Parnassus to visit there his mother's father. One morning with his uncles, young Odysseus went up the slope of the mountain Parnassus to hunt with hounds. In a thick lair a mighty boar was lying. When the sound of the men's trampling came near him, he sprang up with gleaming eyes and stood before them all. Odysseus, holding his spear in his hands, rushed upon him. But before he could strike him, the boar charged, ripping deep into his flesh with his tusk. Then Odysseus speared him through the shoulder, and the boar was slain. His uncle staunched the wound, and he stayed with them on the mountain Parnassus, in his grandfather's house, until the wound was healed. And now, as Eurycleia, his old nurse, passed her hands along the leg, she let his foot drop suddenly. His knee struck against the bath, and the vessel of water was overturned. The nurse touched the chin of Odysseus, and she said, "'Thou art Odysseus.' She looked to where Penelope was sitting, so that she might make a sign to her. But Penelope had her eyes turned away. Odysseus put his hand on Eurycleia's mouth, and with the other he drew her to him. "'Woman,' he whispered, "'say nothing. Be silent, lest mine enemies learn what thou knowest.' "'Silent I'll be,' said the nurse, Eurycleia. "'Thou knowest me. Firm and unyielding I am, and by no sign will I let any one know that thou hast come under this roof.' So saying, she went out of the hall to fetch water in the place of that which had been spilt. She came back and finished bathing his feet. Then Odysseus arranged the rags around his leg to hide the scar, and he drew the bench closer to the fire. Penelope turned to him again. "'Wise thou art, my guest,' she said, "'and it may be that thou art just such a man as can interpret a dream that comes to me constantly. I have twenty geese in the yard outside. In my dream I see them, and then a great eagle flies down from the mountains and breaks their necks and kills them all, and lays them in a heap in this hall. I weep and lament for my geese, but then the eagle comes back, and perching on a beam of the roof speaks to me in the voice of a man.' "'Take heart, O wife of Odysseus,' the eagle says. "'This is no dream but a true vision, for the geese that thou hast seen are thy wooers, and I that appeared as an eagle am thy husband, who will swiftly bring death to the wooers. Then the dream goes, and I waken and look out on the daylight, and see my geese in the courtyard pecking at the wheat in the trough. Canst thou interpret this dream?' "'Lady,' said Odysseus, "'the dream interprets itself.' All will come about as thou hast dreamed. Ah, said Penelope, it cannot now, for the day of my woe is at hand. I am being forced by my parents to choose a husband from the wooers, and depart from the house of Odysseus. And how wilt thou choose from amongst them? said Odysseus. In this way will I make choice, said Penelope. My husband's great bow is still in the house. The one who can bend that bow and shoot an arrow through the holes in the backs of twelve axes set one behind the other, him will I choose for my husband. Said Odysseus, Thy device is good, Penelope, and some god hath instructed thee to do this. But delay no longer the contest of the bow. Let it be to-morrow. Is that thy counsel, O stranger? said Penelope. It is my counsel, said Odysseus. I thank thee for thy counsel, she said, and now farewell, for I must go to my rest. And do thou lie down in the vestibule, in the bed that has been made for thee. So Penelope spoke, and then she went to her chamber with her handmaidens, and in her bed she thought over all the stranger had told her of Odysseus, and she wept again for him. End of section 27《of the Adventures of Odysseus》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. The Adventures of Odysseus and the Tale of Troy by Parak Colum. Part Two, Chapter Thirteen. All night Odysseus lay awake, tossing this side and that, as he pondered on how he might slay the wooers and save his house from them. As soon as the dawn came, he went into the open air, and lifting up his hands prayed to Zeus, the greatest of the gods, that he might be shown some sign as to whether he would win victory or meet with defeat. 
and then, as he was going within the house, he heard the voice of a woman who ground barley-meal between stones. She was one of twelve, but the other women had fallen asleep by the kernstones. She was an ancient, wretched woman, covered all over with the dust of the grain, and as Odysseus came near her, she lifted up her hands and prayed in a weak voice, O Zeus, even for miserable me, fulfill a prayer. May this be the last day that the wooers make their feast in the house of Odysseus. They have loosened my knees with the cruel toil they have made me undergo, grinding for them the barley for the bread they eat. O Zeus, may they to-day sup their last." Thus the kern woman spoke, as Odysseus crossed his threshold. He was glad of her speech, for it seemed to him her words were an omen from Zeus, and that vengeance would be soon wrought upon the proud and hard-hearted men who wasted the goods of the house and oppressed the servants. And now the maids came into the hall from the women's apartment, and some cleaned the tables, and others took pitchers and went to the well for water. The men-servants came in and split the faggots for the fire. Other servants came into the courtyard, Eumaeus the swineherd, driving fatted swine the best of his drove, and Philotius the cattle-herd bringing a calf. The goat-herd Melanthius, him whom Odysseus and Eumaeus had met on the road the day before, also came, bringing the best goats of his flock to be killed for the wooer's feast. When the cattle-herd Philotius saw a stranger in the guise of a beggar, he called out as he tethered the calf in the yard, Hail, stranger friend! My eyes fill with tears as I look on thee. For even now, clad as thou art in rags, dost thou make me think of my master Odysseus, who may be a wanderer such as thou in friendless lands? Ah, that he might return and make a scattering of the wooers in this hall! Eumaeus the swineherd came up to Philotius and made the same prayer. These two, and the ancient woman at the quern, were the only ones of his servants whom he heard pray for his return. And now the wooers came into the hall. Philotius the cattle-herd and Melanthius the evil goat-herd went amongst them, handing them bread and meat and wine. Odysseus stood outside the hall, until Telemachus went to him and brought him within. Now there was amongst the wooers a man named Stestippus, and he was the rudest and the roughest of them all. When he saw Telemachus bringing Odysseus within, he shouted out, here is a guest of Telemachus to whom some gift is due from us. It will be unseemly if he should get nothing to-day. Therefore I will bestow this upon him as a token." Saying this, Stesippus took up the foot of a slaughtered ox and flung it full at Odysseus. Odysseus drew back, and the ox's foot struck the wall. Then did Odysseus smile grimly upon the wooers. Said Telemachus, Verily, Stesippus, the cast turned out happily for thyself. For if thou shouldst have struck my guest, there would have been a funeral feast instead of a wedding banquet in thy father's house. Assuredly I should have driven my spear through thee." All the wooers were silent when Telemachus spoke these bold words. But they soon fell laughing at something one of their number said. The guest from Telemachus's ship, Theoclymenus, was there, and he started up and went to leave the hall. Why dost thou go, my guest? said Telemachus. I see the walls and beams of the roof sprinkled with blood, said Theoclymenus, the second-sighted man. I hear the voice of wailing. I see cheeks wet with tears. The men before me have shrouds upon them. The courtyard is filled with ghosts. So Theoclymenus spoke, and all the wooers laughed at the second-sighted man, for he stumbled about the hall as if it were in darkness. Then said one of the wooers, Lead that man out of the house, for surely he cannot tell day from night. I will go from the place, said Theoclymenus. I see death approaching. Not one of the company before me will be able to avoid it. So saying, the second-sighted man went out of the hall. The wooers looked at each other again, and laughed, and one of them said, Telemachus has no luck in his guests. One is a dirty beggar who thinks of nothing but what he can put from his hand into his mouth, and the other wants to stand up here and play the seer." So the wooers spoke in mockery, but neither Telemachus nor Odysseus paid heed to their words, for their minds were bent upon the time when they should take vengeance upon them. CHAPTER Fourteen. 
In the treasure-chamber of the house Odysseus's great bow was kept. That bow had been given to him by a hero named Iphithus long ago. Odysseus had not taken it with him when he went to the wars of Troy. To the treasure-chamber Penelope went. She carried in her hand the great key that opened the doors, a key all of bronze with a handle of ivory. Now as she thrust the key into the locks, the doors groaned as a bull groans. She went within, and saw the great bow upon its peg. She took it down and laid it upon her knees, and thought long upon the man who had bent it. Beside the bow was its quiver full of bronze-weighted arrows. The servant took the quiver, and Penelope took the bow, and they went from the treasure-chamber and into the hall where the wooers were. When she came in she spoke to the company and said, "'Lords of Ithaca and of the islands around, you have each come here desiring that I should wed him. Now the time has come for me to make a choice from amongst you. Here is how I shall make my choice. This is the bow of Odysseus, my lord who is no more. Whosoever amongst you can bend this bow and shoot an arrow from it through the holes in the backs of twelve axes which I shall have set up, him will I wed, and to his house I will go, forsaking the house of my wedlock, this house so filled with treasure and substance, this house which I shall remember in my dreams. As she spoke, Telemachus took the twelve axes and set them upright in an even line, so that one could shoot an arrow through the hole that was in the back of each axe-head. Then Eumaeus, the old swineherd, took the bow of Odysseus and laid it before the wooers. One of the wooers took up the bow and tried to bend it. But he could not bend it, and he laid it down at the doorway with the arrow beside it. The others took up the bow and warmed it at the fire, and rubbed it with lard to make it more pliable. As they were doing this, Eumaeus the swineherd and Philoteus the cattleherd passed out of the hall. Odysseus followed them into the courtyard. He laid a hand on each and said, Swineherd and cattleherd, I have a word to say to you. But will you keep it to yourselves, the word I say? And first, what would you do to help Odysseus if he should return? Would you stand on his side or on the side of the wooers? Answer me now from your hearts. Said Philoteus the cattleherd, May Zeus fulfill my wish and bring Odysseus back. Then thou shouldst know on whose side I would stand. And Eumaeus said, if Odysseus should return I would be on his side, and with all the strength that is in me." When they said this, Odysseus declared himself. Lifting up his hand to heaven, he said, "'I am your master, Odysseus. After twenty years I have come back to my own country, and I find that of all my servants by you two alone is my homecoming desired. If you need see a token that I am indeed Odysseus, look down on my foot. See there the mark that the wild boar left on me in the days of my youth. Straightway he drew the rags from the scar, and the swineherd and the cattleherd saw it and marked it well. Knowing that it was indeed Odysseus who stood before them, they cast their arms around him and kissed him on the head and shoulders. And Odysseus was moved by their tears, and he kissed their heads and their hands. As they went back to the hall, he told Eumaeus to bring the bow to him as he was bearing it through the hall. He told him, too, to order Eurycleia, the faithful nurse, to bar the doors of the women's apartment at the end of the hall, and to bid the women, even if they heard a groaning and a din, not to come into the hall. And he charged the cattle-herd Philoteus to bar the gates of the courtyard. As he went into the hall, one of the wooers, Eurymachus, was striving to bend the bow. As he struggled to do so, he groaned aloud, "'Not because I may not marry Penelope do I groan, but because we youths of to-day are shown to be weaklings beside Odysseus, whose bow we can in no way bend. Then Antinous, the proudest of the wooers, made answer and said, Why should we strive to bend the bow to-day? Nay, lay beside the bow, Eurymachus, and let the wine-bearers pour us out a cupful each. In the morning let us make sacrifice to the archer-god, and pray that the bow be fitted to some of our hands. Then Odysseus came forward and said, Sirs, you do well to lay the bow aside for to-day. But will you not put the bow into my hands, that I may try to bend it, and judge for myself whether I have any of the strength that once was mine? All the wooers were angry that a seeming beggar should attempt to bend the bow that none of their company were able to bend. Antinous spoke to him sharply, and said, Thou wretched beggar! It is it not enough that thou art let into this high hall to pick up scraps? but thou must listen to our speech and join in our conversation. 
If thou shouldst bend that bow, we will make short shrift of thee, I promise. We will put thee on a ship, and send thee over to King Ectetus, who will cut thee to pieces, and give thy flesh to his hounds." Old Eumaeus had taken up the bow. As he went with it to Odysseus, some of them shouted to him, "'Where art thou going with the bow, thou crazy fellow? Put it down!' Eumaeus was confused by their shouts, and he put down the bow. Then Telemachus spoke to him, and said, "'Eumaeus, beware of being the man who served many masters.' Eumaeus, hearing these words, took it up again and brought it to Odysseus, and put the bow into his hands. As Odysseus stood in the doorway of the hall, the bow in his hands, and with the arrows scattered at his feet, Eumaeus went to Eurycleia, and told her to bar the door of the women's apartment at the back. Then Philoteus, the cattle-herd, went out of the hall and barred the gates leading out of the courtyard. For long Odysseus stood with the bow in his hands, handling it as a minstrel handles a lyre when he stretches a cord or tightens a peg. Then he bent the great bow. He bent it without an effort, and at his touch the bowstring made a sound that was like the cry of a swallow. The wooers, seeing him bend that mighty bow, felt, every man of them, a sharp pain at the heart. They saw Odysseus take up an arrow and fit it to the string. He held the notch, he drew the string, and he shot the bronze-weighted arrow straight through the holes in the back of the axe-heads. Then, as Eumaeus took up the axes and brought them outside, he said, Thou seest, Lord Telemachus, that thy guest does not shame thee through foolish boasting. I have bent the bow of Odysseus, and I have shot the arrow aright. But now it is time to provide the feast for the lords who woo thy lady mother. While it is yet light, the feast must be served to them, and with the feast they must have music and the dance. Saying this he nodded to Telemachus, bending his terrible brows. Telemachus instantly girt his sword upon him and took his spear in his hand. Outside was heard the thunder of Zeus. And now Odysseus had stripped his rags from him, and was standing upright, looking a master of men. The mighty bow was in his hands, and at his feet were scattered many bronze-weighted arrows. End of section 28。T9 of the Adventures of Odysseus。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. The Adventures of Odysseus and the Tale of Troy by Park Colum. Part 2, Chapter 15. It is ended, Odysseus said. My trial is ended. Now will I have another mark." Saying this, he put the bronze-weighted arrow against the string of the bow, and shot at the first of his enemies. It was at Antinous he pointed the arrow, at Antinous who was even then lifting up a golden cup filled with wine, and who was smiling, with death far from his thoughts. Odysseus aimed at him, and smote him with the arrow in the throat, and the point passed out clean through his neck. The wine-cup fell from his hands, and Antinous fell dead across the table. Then did all the wooers raise a shout, threatening Odysseus for sending an arrow astray. It did not come into their minds that this stranger beggar had aimed to kill Antinous. But Odysseus shouted back to them, "'Ye dogs! Ye that said in your hearts that Odysseus would never return to his home, Ye that wasted my substance, and troubled my wife, and injured my servants! Ye who showed no fear of heaven, nor of the just judgments of men! Behold, Odysseus returned, and know what death is being loosed on you!" Then Eurymachus shouted out, "'Friends, this man will not hold his hands, nor cease from shooting with the bow until all of us are slain. Now must we enter into the battle with him. Draw your swords, and hold up the tables before you for shields, and advance upon him." But even as he spoke, Odysseus, with a terrible cry, loosed an arrow at him, and shot Eurymachus through the breast. He let the sword fall from his hand, and he too fell dead upon the floor. One of the band rushed straight at Odysseus with his sword in hand. But Telemachus was at hand, and drove his spear through this man's shoulders. Then Telemachus ran quickly to a chamber where there were weapons and armour lying. The swineherd and cattleherd joined him, and all three put armour upon them. 
Odysseus, as long as he had arrows to defend himself, kept shooting at and smiting the wooers. When all the arrows were gone, he put the helmet on his head and took up the shield that Telemachus had brought, and the two great spears. But now Melanthius the goatherd, he who was the enemy of Odysseus, got into the chamber where the arms were kept, and brought out spears and shields and helmets and gave them to the wooers. Seeing the goatherd go back for more arms, Telemachus and Eumaeus dashed into the chamber, and caught him and bound him with a rope, and dragged him up near the roof-beams and left him hanging there. Then they closed and bolted the door, and stood on guard. Many of the wooers lay dead upon the floor of the hall. Now one who was called Agelaus stood forward, and directed the wooers to cast spears at Odysseus. But not one of the spears they cast struck him, for Odysseus was able to avoid them all. And now he directed Telemachus and Eumaeus and Philoteus to cast their spears. When they cast them with Odysseus, each one struck a man, and four of the wooers fell down. And again Odysseus directed his following to cast their spears, and again they cast them and slew their men. They drove those who remained from one end of the hall to the other, and slew them all. Straightway the doors of the women's apartment were flung open, and Eurycleia appeared. She saw Odysseus amongst the bodies of the dead, all stained with blood. She would have cried out in triumph if Odysseus had not restrained her. "'Rejoice within thine own heart,' he said, "'but do not cry aloud, for it is an unholy thing to triumph over men lying dead. These men the gods themselves have overcome, because of their own hard and unjust hearts.' As he spoke the women came out of their chambers, carrying torches in their hands. They fell upon Odysseus, and embraced him, and clasped and kissed his hands. A longing came over him to weep, for he remembered them from of old, every one of the servants who were there. CHAPTER Sixteen. Eurycleia, the old nurse, went to the upper chamber where Penelope lay in her bed. She bent over her and called out, "'Awake, Penelope, dear child! Come down and see with thine own eyes what hath happened. The wooers are overthrown, and he whom thou hast ever longed to see hath come back. Odysseus, thy husband, hath returned. He hath slain the proud wooers who have troubled thee for so long.' But Penelope only looked at the nurse, for she thought that her brain had been turned. Still Eurycleia kept on saying, in very deed Odysseus is here, he is that guest whom all the wooers dishonour in the hall. Then hearing Eurycleia say these words, Penelope sprang out of bed and put her arms round the nurse's neck. Oh, tell me, if what thou sayest be true, tell me how this stranger slew the wooers who were so many. I did not see the slaying, said Eurycleia, but I heard the groaning of the men as they were slain, and then I found Odysseus standing amongst many dead men, and it comforted my heart to see him standing there like a lion aroused. Come with me now, lady, that you may both enter into your heart's delight, you that have suffered so much of affliction. Thy lord hath come alive to his own hearth, and he hath found his wife and his son alive and well. Ah, no, said Penelope, ah, no, Odysseus hath not returned. He who hath slain the wooers is one of the deathless gods, come down to punish them for their injustice and their hard-heartedness. Odysseus long ago lost the way of his returning, and he is lying dead in some far-off land. No, no, said Eurycleia, I can show thee that it is Odysseus indeed who is in the hall. On the foot is the scar that the tusk of a boar gave him in the old days. I spied it when I was washing his feet last night, and I would have told thee of it, but he clapped a hand across my mouth to stop my speech. Lo, I stake my life that it is Odysseus, and none other who is in the hall below." Saying this, she took Penelope by the hand, and led her from the upper chamber into the hall. Odysseus was standing by a tall pillar. He waited there for his wife to come and speak to him. But Penelope stood still, and gazed long upon him, and made no step towards him. Then said Telemachus, Mother, can it be that thy heart is so hard? Here is my father, and thou wilt not go to him nor question him at all?" said Penelope. My mind is amazed, and I have no strength to speak, nor to ask him aught, nor even to look on him face to face. 
if this is indeed Odysseus who hath come home, a place has to be prepared for him. Then Odysseus spoke to Telemachus, and said, Go now to the bath, and make thyself clean of the stains of battle. I will stay and speak with thy lady mother. Strange lady, said he to Penelope, is thy heart indeed so hard? No other woman in the world, I think, would stand so aloof from her husband, who after so much toil and so many trials has come back after twenty years to his own hearth. Is there no place for me here, and must I again sleep in the stranger's bed? Said Penelope, In no stranger's bed wilt thou lie, my lord. Come, Eurycleia, set up for him his own bedstead outside his bedchamber. Then Odysseus said to her, speaking in anger, How comes it that my bed can be moved to this place and that? Not a bed of that kind was the bed I built for myself. Knowest thou not how I built my bed? First there grew up in the courtyard an olive-tree. Round that olive-tree I built a chamber, and I roofed it well, and I set doors to it. Then I sheared off all the light wood on the growing olive-tree, and I rough-hewed the trunk with the adze, and I made the tree into a bedpost. Beginning with this bedpost I wrought a bedstead, and when I finished it I inlaid it with silver and ivory. Such was the bed I built for myself, and such a bed could not be moved to this place or that. Then did Penelope know assuredly that the man who stood before her was indeed her husband, the steadfast Odysseus. None other knew of where the bed was placed and how it had been built. Penelope fell a-weeping, and she put her arms round his neck. "'Oh, Odysseus, my lord,' she said, "'be not angry with thy wife. Always the fear was in my heart that some guileful stranger should come here professing to be Odysseus, and that I should take him to me as my husband. How terrible such a thing would be! But now my heart is freed from all doubts. Be not angry with me, Odysseus, for not throwing myself on thy neck as the women of the house did. Then husband and wife wept together, and Penelope said, It was the gods did this to us, Odysseus, the gods who grudged that we should have joy of the days of our youth. Next they told each other of things that happened in the twenty years they were apart, Odysseus speaking of his own toils and sorrows, and Penelope telling what she had endured at the hands of the wooers. And as they told tales one to the other, slumber came upon them, and the dawn found them sleeping side by side. End of section 29《Of Odysseus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clatt. The Adventures of Odysseus and the Tale of Troy by Park Colum. Part Two, Chapter Seventeen. And still, many dangers had to be faced. The wooers whom Odysseus had slain were the richest and the most powerful of the lords of Ithaca and the islands. All of them had fathers and brothers who would fain avenge themselves upon their slayer. Now before any one in the city knew that he had returned, Odysseus went forth to the farm that Laertes, his old father, stayed at. As he drew near he saw an old man working in the vineyard, digging round a plant. When he came to him he saw that this old man was not a slave or a servant, but Laertes, his own father. When he saw him, Wasted with age and all uncared for, Odysseus stood still, leaning his hand against a pear-tree, and sorrowing in his heart. Old Laertes kept his head down as he stood digging at the plant, and he did not see Odysseus until he stood before him and said, "'Old man, thou dost care for this garden well, and all things here are flourishing—fig-tree and vine and olive and pear. But if a stranger may say it, Thine own self is not cared for well. Who art thou that dost speak to me like this? Old Laertes said, lifting his head. I am a stranger in Ithaca, said Odysseus. I seek a man whom I once kindly treated, a man whose name was Odysseus. A stranger he came to me, and he declared that he was of Ithaca, and that one day he would give me entertainment for the entertainment I had given him. I know not if this man be still alive." Old Laertes wept before Odysseus. "'Ah,' said he, "'if thou hadst been able to find him here, the gifts you gave him would not have been bestowed in vain. 
True hospitality thou wouldst have received from Odysseus, my son. But he has perished, far from his country's soil he has perished, the hapless man. And his mother wept not over him, nor his wife, nor me his father. So he spake, and then with his hands he took up the dust of the ground, and he strewed it over his head in his sorrow. The heart of Odysseus was moved with grief. He sprang forward and fell on his father's neck, and he kissed him, saying, Behold, I am here, even I, my father. I, Odysseus, have come back to mine own country. Cease thy lamentation until I tell thee of the things that have happened. I have slain the wooers in mine hall, and I have avenged all their injuries and all their wrongful doings. Dost thou not believe this, my father? Then look on what I will show thee. Behold on my foot the mark of the boar's tusk. There it is from the days of my youth. Laertes looked down on the bare foot, and he saw the scar. But still his mind was clouded by doubt. But then Odysseus took him through the garden, and he told him of the fruit-trees that Laertes had set for him, when he, Odysseus, was a little child, following his father about the garden, thirteen pear-trees and ten apple-trees and forty fig-trees. When Odysseus showed him these, Laertes knew that it was indeed his son who stood before him, his son come back after twenty years wandering. He cast his arms around his neck, and Odysseus caught him fainting to his breast, and led him into the house. Within the house were Telemachus and Eumaeus the swineherd, and Philoteus the cattleherd. They all clasped the hand of Laertes, and their words raised his spirits. Then he was bathed, and when he came from the bath, rubbed with olive oil, he looked hale and strong. Odysseus said to him, Father, surely one of the gods has made thee goodlier and greater than thou wert a while ago. Said the old hero Laertes, Ah, my son! Would that I had such might as when, long before thou wert born, I took the castle of Nurseus there upon the foreland. Would that in such might and with such mail upon my shoulders I stood with thee yesterday when thou didst fight with the wooers. While they were speaking in this way, the rumour of the slaying of the wooers went through the city. Then those who were related to the men slain went into the courtyard of Odysseus's house, and brought forth the bodies. Those who belonged to Ithaca they buried, and those who belonged to the islands they put upon ships, and sent them with fisher-folk, each to his own home. Many were wroth with Odysseus for the slaying of a friend. He who was the most wroth was Eurypethus, the father of Antinous. There was an assembly of the men of the country, and Eurypethus spake in it, and all who were there pitied him. He told how Odysseus had led away the best of the men of Ithaca, and how he had lost them in his ships, and he told them how, when he returned, he slew the noblest of the men of Ithaca and the islands in his own hall. He called upon them to slay Odysseus, saying, If we avenge not ourselves on the slayer of our kin, we will be scorned for all time as weak and cowardly men. As for me, life will be no more sweet to me. I would rather die straightway and be with the departed. Up now, and let us attack Odysseus and his followers before they take ship and escape across the sea. Many in that assembly put on their armour, and went out with old Eupithius. And as they went through the town, they met with Odysseus and his following as they were coming from the house of Laertes. Now as the two bands came close to each other, Odysseus with Telemachus and Laertes, with the swineherd and the cattleherd, with Dolius, Laertes' servant, and with the six sons of Dolius, and Eupithius with his friends, a great figure came between. It was the figure of a tall, fair, and splendid woman. Odysseus knew her for the goddess Pallas Athena. "'Hold your hands from fierce fighting, ye men of Ithaca,' the goddess called out in a terrible voice. "'Hold your hands!' Straightway the arms fell from each man's hands. Then the goddess called them together, and she made them enter into a covenant that all bloodshed and wrong would be forgotten, and that Odysseus would be left to rule Ithaca as a king in peace. So ends the story of Odysseus, who went with King Agamemnon to the wars of Troy, who made the plan of the wooden horse by which Priam's city was taken at last, who missed the way of his return, and came to the land of the lotus-eaters, 
who came to the country of the dread Cyclops, to the island of Aeolus and to the house of Circe the Enchantress, who heard the song of the Sirens, and came to the rocks wandering, and to the terrible Charybdis and to Scylla, past whom no other man had won scathless, who landed on the island where the cattle of the sun grazed, and who stayed upon Ogygia, the home of the nymph Calypso. So ends the story of Odysseus, who would have been made deathless and ageless by Calypso, if he had not yearned always to come back to his own hearth and his own land. And spite of all his troubles and his toils, he was fortunate, for he found a constant wife, and a dutiful son, and a father still alive to weep over him. End of section 30 End of The Adventures of Odysseus and the Tale of Troy By Parik Colum Read by Elizabeth Clett August and September 2011